Susrei teng ok nia, som swa kom nao mut mondol, seksa kmai na sim riep. Hello and welcome everyone to our. Ah, 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 ah. Hello, hello. Okay. It doesn't seem like it. <laughs> um, so welcome and hello everyone to our special event, a book talk with Dr. Henri Locard. Um, we are very fortunate to have Henri with us today to talk about his recent publication called Jungle Heart of the Khmer Rouge, um, which discusses the role of the upland Khmer, um, specifically a person named P. Puan, who we'll talk about a lot more in the coming hour. Before we get started and begin our talk with Henri, um, first I'd just like to um, remind everybody, or if you don't know already, that CKS, the Center for Khmer Studies, is celebrating its 25th anniversary this year. Um, CKS was established in 1999, and as part of its 25th anniversary, um, CKS will be conducting several special events like this one, this book talk. Um, and also, for example, this coming weekend will be the third mini book fair that will be held here at CKS at Wat Domnak in Siem Reap. Um, to begin, um, I'd just like to begin by kind of introducing and asking Henri to talk a little bit about his early um, contact with Cambodia. Um, and his the first time Henri came to Cambodia was in 1964. So quite a while ago, right? I mean, that's um, 60 years ago, isn't it? So Henri, uh, could you please just tell us about why was it that you first came to Cambodia in 1964, your first trip to Cambodia? Well, 1964 um, was first because I was young. Uh, I was um, in the last year or beginning of the last year of my studies. And at that age, as the age of uh, all students, we dream of knowing the world and traveling throughout the world. One. Two, uh, my studies were English, English language and literature. And for that, I spent three years in England, uh, one year as an assistant in a secondary school, one year as a lecturer in a university, and one year as a researcher at Leicester University, yes, and one year as a researcher at Queen's College, Cambridge, uh, Oxford, sorry, Sox, Oxford. Um, when I was at Leicester, I was the same age as my students. Uh, I was the lector who was supposed to help the students with the French language and with the French culture and everyday life. And I became very friendly with a certain Tom White, who uh, had met, done the same thing in France. That is, he spent one year in France in a French school. And he met a girl, a very pretty girl, Danielle and whom he married at the end of his BA uh, studies. And I attended the wedding ceremony. They were very poor because the parents did not like him to marry a foreigner. And uh, so we just shared a, 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 a packet of biscuits. And that was all for the uh, wedding lunch or, or breakfast or dinner, whatever you call it. And instead of becoming a French teacher in upper secondary schools in England, he applied for uh, the British Council and he was sent to Phnom Penh uh, with his wife. And uh, he invited me to go to Cambodia. So of course, uh, it was a private visit. Uh, from the representative of the British Council. The British Council here was essentially a big library like CKS, but of, of English books. It did organize 
uh, like the French Cultural Center, did not organize teaching of the English language. It was essentially, there was a few conferences, but it was essentially a library. Unfortunately, it was sacked on the instigation of Sianuk in 19, a couple of years later. So, um, and uh, so they left the country and never came back. So we don't have a British Council. Interesting. So after you received this invitation, my understanding is you arrived in Cambodia by ship, by boat. You That's right. Uh, I did the same. I'm the same age as Father Francois Pouchot. And uh, exactly. And from, uh, both from myself and Father Wonsou, we came by boat. And it was absolutely an ideal travel. I cannot understand why uh, it's not uh, available today because it was exactly three weeks and you went from Marseille to Barcelona. Barcelona, we crossed the whole of the Atlantic to Portside, Portside, Suez, Suez, Aden, Aden, Bombay, Bombay, Colombo, Colombo, um, uh, Singapore, Singapore, Saigon. The, the dream. So I grew gradually into, into Asia instead of being but dumped, you know, like a parachute suddenly in Phnom Penh. It sounds a lot better than taking a 18 hour plane ride. <laughs> um, so you arrived and my understanding is you actually hitchhiked through Cambodia, going through Ratanakiri on your way to Phnom Penh? Yes, uh, I hitchhiked. I had little money. I was a student uh, and I hitchhiked through the country and in particular to Ratanakiri and to the Bolovan in South Laos. So that was my first contact with Ratanakiri. And the province had been created just five years before, 1955. And in Ratanakiri, you had two things. You had the forest and the tomb stiot. Uh, virtually no Khmers, very, very few Khmers. In the valleys, you had some Laotians and some, a few Vietnamese too. But virtually when uh, the province was created in Ratanakiri, there was no Khmer. So you must have been one of the few Barang that the Khmer Le, the upland Khmer, um, had met. There's very few. You must have been one of the few foreigners or Barang um, that the yes. upland well, Khmer had well, as, you, as you can imagine, if you can work out the dates. Uh, fortunately, I took the aggregation, you know, difficult exam in the following year. And therefore, I completed, I became a civil servant, a French civil servant, and uh, I had to do military service. I didn't want to have anything to do with weapons and soldiery, so I could do civilian service instead. So I asked for Phnom Penh, and I got Phnom Penh. Uh, that was in July 1965. And in September 1965, I arrived here and taught uh, English from, for, at that time, the lower secondary and upper secondary were in just one and the same places, and even the primary school. Uh, now it's become the business school. Uh, and I had students from uh, grade one to uh, grade 11 and 12. And one of my students was Somura Chulong, uh, the daughter of uh, Nyak Chulong, and the wife of this abominable Sam Rensi. Ah, I see. Um, Don't forget the um, abominable. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so you were, you were teaching at Lise Descartes, just in case people didn't hear that. Lise Descartes, which is a school, French school in Phnom Penh. It's located near Wat Phnom. Um, and you were there for about two years doing your mandatory right. civil service. Yes. So could you tell us what was it like to be in, Phnom, in Cambodia and in Phnom Penh in what is called the golden era, 1965, 1966. What were your impressions of Cambodia at that time? Yes, it was very exotic, uh, but there were far more French people uh, in the Sankum period than during independence. There were French advisors in every ministry because French was the language of administration and teaching more or less. Uh, and there were French teachers in every upper secondary schools in the whole country. 
And the, uh, it was the time when Sihanouk created all the uh, faculties and, and universities. There's only one university, University of Phnom Penh, with many faculties. Uh, the first one, I think, was medicine. And then they had law, uh, architecture, agriculture, gradually. And of course, the Royal University of Phnom Penh, that was a, a teaching uh, institution for upper secondary uh, students, essentially. Wonderful. So now let's, I find this very interesting that you, when you arrived in Cambodia in 1964, you went to Ratanakiri, something very few people would do. Um, and now if we switch to your most recent book published just last year in 2023, um, Jungle, Heart of the Khmer Rouge, Memoirs of P. Poon. P. Poon, of course, is from Ratanakiri. He is a member of the hill tribe there, the Jarai. Um, now, it's interesting that you were in Ratanakiri in 1964, and Pi the topic of this book, the person that you spent so much time interviewing and researching, he, at that time, he's nine years younger than you. He was about 17 years old in 1964. At that time, Pi was busy establishing a rebel base. Could you tell us a little bit about what Pi person that you wrote about in this book was doing at that time. Why was he establishing a rebel base? What was the um, the reasons behind wanting to rebel for the Highlanders? Um, I, I don't quite understand the question because there's echoes. Uh, uh, do you mean, uh, why did, did I get specifically interested in Ratanakiri? Or why did Pipun, at about that time, establish his own, with a couple of friends, uh, revolutionary, joined the Maquis, created the Maquis? Exactly. And, what, and, what, and, yes. Could you tell us why he did that? Be, because his father had worked for the Viet Minh during the First Indo-Chinese War. What is very important is you get the chronology correct. First Indo-Chinese War, 1945-1946. 1946, 1954. Uh, that is before the creation of Ratanakiri. In those years, there was only Stung Treng, uh, the big Stung Treng uh, province. And the, 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 these Jarais, the Jarais are not very numerous in Cambodia, but they are restricted to Bokeo or Andong Mir uh, districts uh, near the Sri. Uh, the Cezanne and near the Vietnamese border. Uh, and there are far more Jarais in Vietnam than in Cambodia. Now, during the first Indo-Chinese war, and I knew about it, the Viet Minh occupied completely Northeast Cambodia and uh, spread throughout Cambodia, up now up as far as Batambang, so, and they tried to establish a maquis. They tried to uh, uh, connect with the Khmer Viet Minh, that is the Khmers who uh, sympathizes with uh, the, the communist revolution, which were a very small minority. And the father of Pipun and Ratchan Feng insisted, and it's in my book, you are being despised by the rest of the population you are very poor, but if you join the revolution, you will be at top of the society, respected and rich. Thank you. Um, before we continue, I, I just want to do a little sound check. I think it's very difficult for people to understand, right, with these mics. Can you hear us okay? It, it sounds like there's a lot of echo. Or is it, is it clear if we speak normally? Okay, like this. Oops. Can okay. can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Too close. Too close. Too close. Too close. All right. In between. In between. Because these sounds like that. If we just speak normally like this, the people in the room can hear us. And even though we're not amplified, 
the people on Facebook will be able to hear us as well because the mics will pick up our voices and it will be broadcast. So we can do this. Don't they yep. see you, Joel? We can just hold it. We can hold it about this far from our mouth. Oh, this far. All right. Yes, is that better? Okay. Okay, so to continue now, what, what's really interesting here historically is that here we are in the mid-1960s, 1965, 66, 67, when, by the way, you are in Phnom Penh, you are in Cambodia. It's during the time of the Vietnam War, and it's also the time when the Khmer Rouge started to leave Phnom Penh and go up to Ratanakiri to establish their military bases in the Marquis. And Thi Puan, Thi Puan was a very important piece or part of that process. Um, could you tell us about when he met, for example, Pol Pot, Thieu Son Pon, Son Sen, and what he did to help them establish their bases in Ratanakiri, the very first Khmer Rouge bases where the revolution, the armed revolution, essentially began. The recorded voice? Yes. It, 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 oh, you want to record? Yes, it's fine. <laughs> so the, the, the question again is, could you tell us a little more about Thi Puan's role as the Khmer Rouge leadership Pol Pot, Son San, Thieu Son Pon, Nguyen Chia arrived in Ratanakiri to establish Munti Maroi, Munti Maroi B, um, and really begin the armed struggle of the uh, part of the revolution. Right. So I was uh, saying that uh, the Viet Minh was very present uh, in Cambodia during the first Indo-Chinese War. And it made the first conversions to the revolution, to the communist revolution. Um, now, um, after the Geneva Agreement, 1954, uh, the first Indo-Chinese War was supposed to be finished, and the Viet Minh was obliged to quit to leave Cambodia completely. And do not, uh, in fact, they did not, according to Pipun and the Jarai, they had a secret base in the three borders area in the far eastern, uh, northeastern area of Cambodia. They still kept a base there. And very soon they came back gradually, and particularly since 1962. Uh, gradually, and they created the Ho Chi Minh Trail so that the communists were in the north and the democrats were in the south, in Vietnam. And the north wanted to conquer the south. Now, as in the center of Cambodia is very narrow, as you know, so it was very quite easy to block the troops coming from the north to go south. So they bypassed through South Laos and uh, Eastern Cambodia by creating a number of parallel Ho Chi Minh Trail where the Viet Minh could gradually infiltrate and, and travel through with bicycle. They made the, the peace because otherwise before you could only travel on foot or on elephants. And my first travel in Ratanakiri were on elephants in 1966 and I hired two elephants. There were, every village had elephants, and it was quite cheap. And then I was stopped at some stage. I went to the east, and then I was stopped by policemen that suddenly came out and said, no, no, you cannot go further. I did not know why. It's only later that I realized I would have bumped into the Vietnamese. I would have seen the Vietnamese sanctuaries, which were secret. And they did not want the foreigners to see the Vietnamese present uh, in the mid 90s, as early as the mid 1960s. And could you tell us about P. Puan's role as now, welcoming the Khmer Rouge leadership? Yes. Tradition? Well, uh, P. Puan, it so happened also to me. Sorry, I'm coming back to me. Chao Seng, who had been Minister of Education and head of the cabinet of Sianuk 
came to Cisava to De Lycée Descartes and asked me, I don't know why me, to come and write articles for his review, official review, uh, Kabuja. And he wanted me to be, do a report on the Labanse rubber plantation, the first massive plantation that was started in 1961. So I made this investigation 1966, and the trees, the first tree, the oldest trees were about five years old, and you could start to bleed them from the age for, after four or five years. Uh, so I was accompanied by the brother of the minister. The minister was Okun uh, Peng, and I was accompanied by his uh, brother, Hutung Lip, who was a great uh, agriculturalist, a specialist in agriculture. Uh, I did this investigation at the same time as a, an anthropologist, uh, Matras something, which I have in my book, and she examined, she, because the anthropologist studies just the village, but she doesn't look into the history of the village. She looks at uh, how life is organized and uh, the language, the rituals, how slash and burn agriculture was organized. And I learned from her that the slash and burn fields were not communal fields. They had stripes of land which were com completely individual going from the top to the bottom, so that when they went to their land, they did not have to cross the land of other people, right? So I had the view of an anthropologist, the view of the government, and I think I try in this book to give a balanced view of what were the, um, uh, the, the plantation, the uh, rubber plantation at that time, 1966. And uh, Labansik rubber plantation was the only vast and state plantation in Ratanakiri. They were only small in the further east. They were only small and private plantations, uh, either from Khmer Kraum or Khmer Kandal or from uh, uh, the Tunchet, because the Tunchet, if they wished, they were given saplings and they could start their plantations if they wanted. But there was no massive spoliation of land at that time. The spoliation of land started in the 80s, 90s, especially in the 90s and early 2000s. Okay, so I'm going to answer my own question. So my understanding from reading your book is that when Pol Pot and Kyusum Pong and Iyung Sari arrived in Ratanakiri, they were helped by P. Poon, who we see above here, and to establish their military base, Munti Muroi and Munti uh, 102. And Pipun's role, as you describe in your book, is to be the source of supplies. Everything that they needed to exist in the, in, in the jungle, everything from rice and food um, to paper to write on. Then, as time went on, there, became, there was this relationship between the Khmer Rouge leadership and people like Pipun and the other Jarai um, Highlanders, hill, hill tribes, a very trusting relationship, at least initially, yes? Um, and the Khmer Rouge leadership put their trust more in the Highlanders than they did in the Khmer Kraum. And um, they also were enamored, they loved the way that the Highlanders lived the way that they grew food and that the way that, that they shared their, their, their tools and their way of living together. And according to your book, the Khmer leadership borrowed many ideas from the way the Khmer Le, the Highlanders, lived as they were developing their plans for collectivization. Would, would you say that's a fair summary of your idea? Yes, quite. Um, yeah, you summarize it quite well. Um, First of all, well, all the leaders except Nguyen Chia. Nguyen Chia was on a visit, but he was based in, the, in Western Cambodia, near Batambang. Uh, but the whole leadership, from Pol Pot to uh, Son Sen, uh, uh, Yeng Sari, Yeng Sari was very important, uh, were uh, establishing their bases uh, from 60, 
67, the first uh, Kandal, I don't know how to, arrived in 1964. Uh, and Pol Pot, Yang Sari arrived uh, in 1966. And they, they left in 1970. So 67, sorry, 67. The first uh, revolutionary. And I think this was still entirely manipulated by the Khmer Viet Minh because the secret base when Pol Pot uh, uh, and, um, and Yang Sari uh, went to the Maquis uh, in, in uh, 1963, they, there was no Khmer Rouge base. Khmer Rouge movement was very small, so they went to Viet Minh base near Mimot. But the area near Mimot, uh, they were looked down upon by the Vietnamese so they wanted to uh, free themselves from the influence of the Vietnamese one, but mainly the Vietnamese advised them to go to the Northeast because they would be better protected from American bombing. There was a lot of American bombing around Memot. Right. And so they went up the uh, Ho Chi Minh Trail uh, and uh, they, 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 when they arrived, they found uh, locally already a number of tribal people uh, converted to the idea of a communist revolution. So they didn't start from zero, they, that helped them. So they were training, so, as you said, yes, they misread the, the way of life of the Tun Tiet because they thought that it was a collect, they, everything was collective, that they lived in very close villages, that they even eat together, uh, that they, they would cultivate the slash and burn uh, together. Uh, they misread that. But anyway, Pol Pot, particularly his wife, Kiu Ponari, uh, who was highly intelligent and cultivated, and she formed the first women's association, as you know. She was a teacher at Sisovat. Uh, and they were convinced that it was primitive communism. The very simple philosophy of history that Marx had said men lived collectively at first. So it was primitive communism. Then you had feudalism and then you had capitalism and then you will have communism. I mean, this is a completely absurd view of society because feudalism they never, as we knew in Europe, never really existed in Cambodia. A primitive communism, of course, there was a lot of self-help, but I mean, they had privately, uh, they cultivated the land privately and so on, although they helped each other considerably. So, and but the main other source is, of course, the people's communes in China. And in the people's communes in China, everything had to be produced locally. You had agriculture and arts and crafts and, and, and uh, factories together, but they were much bigger than in China. So the idea that, uh, and also what they admired is that they did not use currency, they had no money, and they can produce locally everything. So you don't need trade. The only thing that they bought, which was expensive, were the gongs <laughs> that had to be come from Vietnam or from I don't know where, uh, from very far and was very expensive. So they entirely misread and they imposed uh, I, and uh, Marie-Alexandrine Martin, a French, uh, the Mal Cambodian, just translated into English, used the phrase, the tribalization of Cambodian society. Uh, but it was quite different. And what I insist on, and I say it again and again, in fact, uh, although they very much respected their way of life and the solidarity, they destroyed the way of life of the Tun Tet even more than the rest of the Cambodians. Because the rest of the Cambodians, they're the new people who were moved from one end of the country. The, oh, most of the old people stayed put, or they were only moved locally. While the tribal people were all moved from the, from the uh, plateau, and they had to and abandon slash and burn which was the essence of their culture, slash and bird fields. And by the way, it produces the best rice that I've ever eaten from slash and bird fields. It's delicious, right? But of course, the, in the in income is not very high. 
uh, so they all had to leave the, the plateau, the rich red uh, red soil plateau, and live in the in the in the uh, in the valleys of the Cezanne and the Srepok, essentially. So everything was destroyed, including their own language, all their rituals, the, all their way of uh, practicing agriculture. They, they were completely cheated. So thank you, Henry Tongui, for that. So the 1960s um, came to an end. And as you said, um, the bombing was intensifying. Um, the war with Vietnam was intensifying. The um, and by 1970, as we know, Notre Dame Sihanouk was removed from power, and General Lanal and the Khmer Republic began. And by that time, 1970, it was no longer safe for Pol Pot and the Khmer leadership, Yung Sari and Kyu Pont, to remain in Ratanakiri. So they began what you describe in your book as the Long March. They left secretly because if they, if, if for example, the US Army or intelligence knew that they were leaving, they would have been targeted. So they had to leave secretly, and, and Pi Puan was also instrumental in helping them, as I understand it, um, secretly escape from Ratanakiri on their way to Kompong Chinang, is that correct? Kampong Cham. In Tinit, which is at the border between Kampong Cham and Kampong Tham, uh, along Stung Tinit, which is a small river that comes from uh, Pravi here and goes into the Tonisap. Uh, yes, and curiously enough, this march took several months. Well, first of all, they were very numerous, about 80 people. And among these 80 people, there were up to 60 Tun Tiet, and the rest Tuntiet. were Khmer, Tun Tiet. Sorry. Uh, and the, um, why it took so long is because it had to remain absolute, right? not to receive bombing from the Republic or from America. Uh, and, and therefore, they only went through the forest. So from in Ratanakiri, they started from the north of Ratanakiri. They went to uh, Lumpat and south of Ratanakiri. And then they arrive in Modolkiri, and they cross Modolkiri from north to south, which is quite long, and only through the forest. Either they walked, or they even used elephants, uh, or uh, sometimes motorbikes, well, all kinds. And then they went through the, uh, they crossed the Mekong just north of Kompong Cham, and went straight west. Thank you. Uh, so this took a long time, and what I insist on is that the entire leadership was there except Nunchir. Mm -hmm. Nunchir was not with them. He was controlling the rest of the country. But the entire leadership was there. Uh, in Ratanakiri, they met, they had meetings. They were there in Stungtinit for several years between 1970 uh, and uh, 1974, 73, 74. Uh, Sienu came to visit the Maquis, as you know, in, uh, in, in March 1973. The entire Khmer Rouge leadership was there too, except Nunchia. I looked and looked and looked and asked all these photographs, and we don't see Nunchia because Nunchia and Pol Pot, and I explained that in my book, were uh, equal. Uh, it were brother number one and brother number two were mo most important. So when brother number one was somewhere, brother number two uh, did not go with him. Uh, if brother number one was in China, of course, uh, Nguyen Xi would be the prime minister here, and so on. And never, 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 all these leaders, even during the, the, the second Congress of the party in 1970, which was preceded by a, a re-education session, but re-education with Pol Pot and the lead and, and Ki Sampan and all the leadership did not last like, uh, I thought it was like uh, uh, Christians um, make retreats, you know, if you are a Christian, at least the Catholics, they make retreats, but the retreat lasts one or two or three days. But with Pol Pot, it was one month. So for one month, they were all there. Never, never, never they were bombed by America. Simply because there were no 
Then there were no traitors, there were no spies, American traitors, American spies. While the whole of the Khmer Rouge ideas were that there were spies all over the place. And that's why they killed so many people, because they were accused of being both CIA, KGB, and Viet Minh spies in one and only person. This was entirely, entirely untrue. Thank you, Henri. So the, the, one of the main themes of your book, in fact, maybe the central theme of your book is the important role that Highlanders played in the Khmer Rouge Revolution. Um, and if we jump ahead now to 1975, April 17th, 1975, the Khmer Rouge take power in Phnom Penh, and we find again P. Porn playing a very important role. Um, he had many um, things that he had to do, including, again, supply Pol Pot and the leadership with their, the, the, the things that they needed, um, from food, again, to stationery, but also cars. I was just going to mention yes. that you, it's, you mentioned how Pol Pot assigned people to repair the old luxury cars that wealthy people owned before the takeover in 1975, so that Pol Pot and, and the Khmer Rouge leadership could use them to travel around and to invite guests from China or, or North Korea to come and, and, and drive them around in the cars. And Pipun's job was to make sure these cars were, were running, right? Yes, and he was also the chauffeur of Pol Pot That's and right. Notre Dame Sino. Could and you talk Nordam a little Sino. bit about that? Yes. Uh, this is why, on, on evidence of that, I can say the Khmer Rouge regime that you've had uh, since independence, it has been the most corrupt because all the property that was in the city was became their private property of Anka Le, the superior Anka. Anka. Uh, they could travel in the luxury cars and Pol Pot say, oh, look after them well, keep them in good state of repairs because we have enough cars for 10 or 20 years. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, and... and uh, uh, so um, for Pol Pot to trust um, Pi Puan as his private chauffeur to drive him around, as you mentioned, to bring him, to bring Pol Pot to, spe to special events like if a new dam was constructed and they had a, a ceremony to open the new dam, it would be Pi Puan who would drive Pol Pot to that section, that zone, as you know, Cambodia was divided into zones, to the northeast zone or the west zone or whatever zone it was, to attend this ceremony. So I'm just surprised and interested and amazed a little bit that it would be a Khmer Le that would have Pol Pot's trust to be his private chauffeur. Because I yes. guess he would have heard and been able, to, would have been able to have many opportunities to assassinate him if he wanted to. Like yes, but this is, uh, I think in my book, or uh, I have a quote from Yang Sari, which is in a book by Ong Tong Huang, J'ai cru au Khmer Rouge, it's in French. It has not been translated into English. And Yang Sari explains at Bung Tabek, uh, which was a re-education camp for the returnees from uh, abroad. And he said, we had the Tuntet as bodyguards because they, they were the most trusted. They would, uh, if and, and I'm attacked, they would all use their own bodies to protect my life. Uh, so they, uh, they kept them. They did not have, and Sianuk did the same when he came back. <laughs> he had North Koreans bodyguards. And when there was a big, man, uh, the first uh, Congress that was in the beginning of the 2000s, I forgot, or it was in the 90s, I think it was in the 90s, at the Royal University of Phnom Penh, uh, UNESCO had asked me to do the report on higher education. And when I went to the, I said, Sianuk must be uh, pre present to uh, speak about, to defend uh, academic freedoms. That your presence is important. He did not come. He said, but if you want to see me, you come to the palace. So all the people who intervened in that conference went to the palace. And I didn't enter the palace with all the others. I entered because I, I came from the UNESCO office opposite. and. I was stopped by the uh, North, uh, North Koreans bodyguard. Said, no, no, you don't come in. Said, oh, but I'm, I'm expected by the Xianuk, so they left me come, go in. You also mentioned that 
um, after the death of Mao in China in November 1976, yes, yes. November 76, 1976, that Pol Pot went on a 19 day trip to China. Um, and again, Chi Hun escorted him and was his bodyguard and um, his main trusted, advi not advisor, but main trusted um, companion during that, during that trip, that 19 day trip to China. Now, why, why uh, uh, Pi Pun went to China? He went to China for two reasons. The first one is the big people uh, or big politicians all over the world, they have their own private bodyguards. And you can see them all the time. So you cannot travel without at least two private bodyguards. One, two. Pi Pun was, imagine, a, a, uneducated, never went to school. He was in charge of welcoming the foreign visitors. He had to supply them with comfortable houses, with the cars, uh, with nice foods, and so on. Uh, he were like a hotel keeper. Right. So when he, he was taken to China to know what to buy, uh, all material for, uh, for the beds, for or whatever cushions or <laughs> things that uh, were, well, so of course, delivered by China because they had no money. Everything that uh, he came for, but he had no money. He could not even bring a, a souvenir for his wife and children, <laughs> for instance. But he could bring many things to uh, for the comfort of the visitors. I'm, I'm curious to in your interviews with with Pi Poon, um, how did he feel about the Khmer Rouge and the revolution as the years went by, 76, 77? And did he, was he aware of the amount of death from starvation and disease and execution? And did that, obviously at the beginning, he was totally committed and devoted to the revolution. And he remained that way all the way through the, the 80s. It wasn't until later that he defected to the Cambodian government in the 1990s. But during that time in the 1970s, um, do you have a sense from your interviews with Pi Poon, was his, uh, his commitment to the revolution, was it beginning to waver or change at all as he accompanied Pol Pot around the country? Yes. Um, well, first of all, everything changed with the arrest of Khoi Thun. Khoi Thun was a very important uh, figure. Uh, he was in charge. Could you remind everybody when that was? What? When that was the arrest of Koichu? 1977. Uh, uh, beginning of 1997. Um, and he was originally in charge of the center and then the north. And he was in, uh, one of the three military leaders who took Phnom Penh on the 17th of April. You had Koichu for the north. Uh, you had Sao Pim for the east. And you had Tamok for the south. The West, they did not take part because they were controlling, making sure that the ties would not come to the rescue of the Republic. So they remained. But so Khoi Thun was responsible for the French embassy because it was north in the city. And he's the one with whom uh, Father Poncho, uh, Bizot negotiated, uh, made sure that all the foreigners were assembled in the French embassy and that their lives were spared. But at some stage, all the Khmer's, those who did not have a French passport, had to leave and were killed. Uh, 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 and in particular, uh, the one who should have been king, Sisavat uh, Moniret, in particular, who was an old gentleman at that time. Uh, so that is Khoi Thun. Khoi Thun was very important. So the arrest of Khoi Thun, who was one of the most trusted and popular uh, leaders, uh, was a great shock for everybody. And then they, they, if they arrest Khoi Thun, why not me? And Sun Sikun, uh, who was the, the friend who introduced me to Pi Poon, uh, the husband of Laurence Pic, uh, felt exactly the same. One, two, in his travels, uh, accompanying Pol Pot to our country, he saw that half the population was starving. And he complained, he said to his boss, Yang Sari, at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, 
No, you can't. You have to feed the people. And he even said it to Pol Pot. To Pol Pot. People and said it to Pol Pot. People and said it to Pol Pot. And Pol Pot replied, mind your own business. Basically, you Pol don't look, you don't make any comments. Uh, you don't look around. That was the law. You must first. You only do your own task. You are located and you don't look around. So are you surprised that people and remained faithful to the revolution? Because he continued to fight through the 70s, through the, uh, through the 80s, when the war with Vietnam began, after the Vietnamese invaded Cambodia or mm. took over Cambodia, and the Khmer Rouge assembled on the Thai-Cambodian border and uh, joined forces with the KPNLF and the, and the, and the um, Khun Sen Tech forces. Um, he born, continued to fight with the Khmer Rouge forces. Are you surprised by that? After yes, uh, it's, it's really surprising that these people, uh, al although they knew that there was a lot of people who disappeared, they, but for a long time, they, the people who were selected to be uh, killed or sent to prison, they were never told that they were going to be re-educated or something. They were told, oh, we, we going, we're giving you a new job somewhere else. We're just taking you somewhere else. But they did not know. Uh, so, because everything was based on secrecy, and this was the theory of uh, Nguyen Chia. Everything was secret. Yeah, as long as we secret, we can maintain, we can exist, uh, we are safe. Because secrecy is at absolute safety. Now, why did it change and it became, uh, uh, your question, it became a fighter in the second civil war or war against Vietnam, because by then, uh, most Khmers, as you know, traditionally do not like the Vietnamese to be, uh, and, and the idea of being occupied because, and controlled entirely by the Vietnamese, they did not like this idea at all. So he was and, and the Jarai in Vietnam were very anti-government, and many joined the full role. Uh, and, and uh, were not prepared to obey the Vietnamese because the Vietnamese did take their lands completely. Yes, that makes good sense. So yeah. Thich Nguyen was m more fighting against the Vietnamese than he was fighting for the Khmer Rouge. Yeah, that yeah. makes perfect sense. Yeah. So the, the 1980s, during this, this, again, this second part of the Civil War, um, is when you returned to Cambodia. You returned to Cambodia in 1987, I believe, with your... 89. Ah, okay. Um, I thought 87 with your wife briefly. No? Okay. Um, so you returned to Cambodia. So before, before the fall of the <laughs> Bernil Wall and before the end of the Cold War, it clearly 1989 is the fall of, you could not. If only two, two kinds of people could come to Cambodia. One, uh, members of UNICEF, uh, um, uh, the Oxford, Oxfam, you know, very few uh, NGOs, or you had a membership card of the Communist Party. For instance, the representative of uh, the French Communist Party, uh, the French Communist newspaper, uh, what's his name? Well, never mind, was permanently staying in Cambodia. And I never was a member of the Communist Party because I seen in 1966 what communism was in China. So I had enough of it. And that it was very unpopular among the people because I speak, I, wherever I go, I speak with the people. And so uh, I could not come. But my wife was a, a medical doctor in health education and she was involved in international adoptions and she was médecin du monde. So she had a mission, an official minister. So I was just a prince consort. Uh, I could accompany my wife. And then uh, Sok Anne gave us the, 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 the visa because there was no embassies. Because the government was not recognized by any democracy or Western countries. So I got my visa in Saigon and in Saigon through telephoning to Sok Anne. And Sok Anne said, yes, you can come, All right? But I was one of the very first, if not the first, non-communist uh, or non-UNICEF uh, to go to Cambodia. Interesting. And it was very lucky. So you're back in Cambodia, and at the end of the Cold War, and at the 
1989, and uh, with the signing of the Paris Agreement in 1991, um, we begin a new phase in, in Pete Poulin's life. Pete Poulin's life. As we know, at that time, um, the PPP, the uh, Cambodian People's Party under Hun Sen and King Sam Rin, they had a tactic to draw the Khmer Rouge and the fighters along the Thai-Cambodian border to defect to the Cambodian government um, called the win-win policy. And Pete Poulin was one of the people who um, agreed to do that. So he stopped fighting, he defected to the royal government of Cambodia, and he, as I believe I read in your book, he was offered a position in Ratanakiri, which he declined. He did not want to do it, um, but he did defect and join the royal government of Cambodia in 1996. In 1996. Yes. Uh, and this is close well, to the time well, of the... Well, well, the young, sorry. Yes, well, it's very strange. These two decades, the 80s and the 90s, how is it that the Khmer Rouge movement dragged on indefinitely when we knew all the crimes, it had lost any uh, uh, re reputation, sensible reputation? Well, there, there's a, a couple of reasons. Is one, uh, the people still believe in the domino theory. You have one country that falls to communism and it pushes the next domino. So they were convinced when the Vietnamese moved in in 79 that the Vietnamese would be in Bangkok in 48 hours, in two days. And it's quite true because the Vietnamese, the Thai army was a, a, a decorative army, liked to uh, walk and wear beautiful uniforms with lots of... Uh, um, uh, decorations, but they never really fought. So they were terrified that the Viet Minh would be in Bangkok very soon. So this is why they treated, fed, uh, uh, and helped to arm uh, the remaining uh, Khmer Rouge to protect their borders. So they served as uh, soldiers to defend uh, Thailand. And then, of course, uh, ASEAN, all the ASEAN countries, uh, totally disapproved of that the, that the Vietnamese got rid of the Khmer Rouge, everybody was happy, but that they remained. Once the dog were, were left, they did not turn to uh, the international uh, communities, to the UNO, New, United Nations, or they didn't turn to ASEAN, come and help us to uh, revive Cambodia. They said, no, nobody can come. Uh, it is our turf. So that, that's uh, very sad for Cambodia because during the, the uh, Cambodia lost one decade of development for Oles. So you, as you said, in 1996, Pete Ford defected to the royal government of Cambodia and Hun Sen personally asked Pete Ford to go back into the countryside and try to convince other Khmer Le to defect with you and come back and, and, and join the, the government. Um, and as we know, by 1998, Pol Pot dies. And at the end of 1998, Nguyen Chia and Ian Sari both defect. No, and, uh, and Kiu Sampon. Kiu Sampon. Nguyen Chia and Kiu Sampon defect to the royal government of Cambodia. And essentially, essentially the Khmer Rouge no longer are existing. Here. It's finished. It's, it's, it's over. It took, it took only two decades, only, tw only 20 years to happen. And then, interestingly, in the 2000s, this is when you personally meet P4. That's right. You come to live in Cambodia in the year 2001 or 2000, I believe. That's right. This institution, CKS, opened, I think it's 2001 or 1999. Right. Um, and it is the, the, the year 1999, that's right, when I uh, was introduced to Sun Sikuen. Why Sun Sikuen? Because a publisher wanted me to write the, a composite portrait of a Khmer Rouge intellectual that was trained in France. So the connection between France and the Khmer Rouge leadership. And I said, no, I don't want to write a composite portrait. I want to write the, uh, uh, find a, a man who could write his own life story. And I thought of Chun Mum immediately, the Mum 
the Chun family, which was very, very famous. And Chun Mum was a big intellectual from uh, Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. And he accepted. Unfortunately, he had a stroke, a terrible stroke, and he could no longer continue. And he said, well, why you don't ask the, the husband of Laurence Pic? So uh, the husband of Laurence Pic was Sun Sikun. I went to him in Ratanakiri, 19, after the first meeting here in CKS, I went to Phnom and I met uh, Sun Sikun, who said, yes, I'm prepared to write my own life. And I already wrote the preface. And the preface was excellent. And he's very intelligent, like his wife. And he wrote beautifully. And that book, uh, unfortunately, has not been translated into English. But everybody says that it teaches you a lot about what is the connection between the French intellectual milieu of the time and the Khmer Rouge movement. So in, in, in 2001, you went to the Thai-Cambodian border, as you just said, and you met. And the, he introduced me and, to and people. He introduced you to people. And people and was all the vice governor of his district. Imagine somebody who never went to school, a vice governor. I mean, he was very clever. Uh, this man is very clever and very apt at learning languages because his Khmer was perfect. Mm. Of course, he didn't speak English or French, but his Khmer was perfect and, and you could began, read and write. And you could, and you, you started to interview him. I knew for, some for Khmer, this. but not enough. And it was Sun Sikun, basically, uh -huh. who write the, the life story of Pipun. And as he had already a lot of experience in writing, he wrote it in French because my French publisher wanted to publish the book. And then when the book was finished, he said, no, I cannot publish because I'm going bankrupt. Now, half of the publishers today are becoming bankrupt because people no longer buy books. They look everything on the internet, right, or e-books. Anyway, so I, I thought, well, as I'm an Anglicist, I, I translated the book myself, and I immediately find a publisher in Copenhagen. So the, the, really the story of the creation of this book began in 2001. When you when you met people on with CKS, yes, and okay, yeah, and yes. you began to interview him, and you interviewed him again in, in 2015 before he that, died, correct? That's no. Um, we started uh, uh, a few years, and then I was busy doing something else and writing other books. This book, for uh, example. For this book, for book. example. That's right. Uh, so I started, we started again in 2011, I think, uh -huh. and I completed by 2000 and beginning of 14, just one month before his sudden death. And we got on very well, like Bizo with, uh, with Dutch yeah, yeah. in some ways. <laughs> yes. yeah, I'm, I understand I'm reading. what you mean. But no, but I'm reading, I'm reading a second book of yeah. Bizo on, on, on yeah. Dutch. And, and, uh, he wanted absolutely to reunite and go back to Ratanakiri. He'd gone back twice already for the death of his father and then of his mother. Uh, so we, he said, we must, I want on the way to visit Previ here because he'd never seen Previ here. Mm -hmm. And he was absolutely thrilled to do this journey with me. And in the morning, I, I had breakfast and soon Sikun told me, oh, I'm sorry, uh, this travel is out because people suddenly died of hemorrhage, head and rage. I think it starts Sabai, you say in Khmer, he was, so, he was so excited to come and travel with me and see Prabhi here, see his family, and he liked he me. Uh, he was so thrilled that... Well, fortunately, his story continues in this book that you've written about him. And it also continues, we didn't mention this, but also in the 2000s, was a very productive time for you. You wrote Pol Pot's Little Red Book. You also wrote Pourquoi les Khmer Rouge. But also, you and Pipon testified at the ECCC, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Can we see the slide of, of, of Pipon at the tribunal? Yes, that is extraordinary that to have a Khmer Rouge in 19, a photograph of a Khmer Rouge in 1976 in Phnom Penh. Uh, he was given by the family, by his brother, this photograph. And you see how he's closed, and he had weapons on him. They, they would never uh, 
move, they would never travel without weapons. That's very interesting, yes. So in, in, in 20, 2012, Pipon was invited to be a witness at the Khmer Rouge trials, and he testified. Could you talk a little bit about what did he talk about during his testimony? Yes, you can move to the next uh, slides. Yes, I think that by and large, uh, I've been quite disappointed with the tribunal um, because it did not, there's vast areas that it never investigated. The provincial prisons, it's, uh, and uh, very few prisons. Two, it never mentioned famine, uh, which is one of the main crimes of the Khmer Rouge. Third, it never mentioned what I call the abolition of childhood. The childhood were no longer allowed to be children under the Khmer Rouge. It's monstrous. It's absolutely monstrous. And no mention under, uh, in the tribunal of that. Uh, they talk at great length of forced marriages. Yes, forced marriages, but they were adults, and some people quite could defend themselves. Right. But children, they cannot. Uh, now, uh, to, to the tribunal was a, a bit disappointing for Pipun, because the interesting things about Pipun is his relation with the king, how he traveled with the king, on oh, several okay. occasions, and took the king to Kobongsom, particularly, and uh, also all the way to Sisopon. Uh, that was quite interesting historically. And secondly, of course, his travel in China. Nothing at all, because they were taboo. You were not allowed to mention China. <laughs> China, Cambodia became a kind of colony of China under the Khmer Rouge. You cannot speak about the Khmer Rouge um, regime without speaking about Mao's China. I don't say China in general, but Mao's China. Uh, and for instance, uh, the Cham were lucky enough to have the label of genocide, but why were they killed more than the other people? Not because they were Cham. I found no slogans against the Cham. It's because they rebelled. And everybody who rebelled whether it was Chi Crane near here or in Peno, all the people uh, that the Khmer Rouge could take, they, they killed, right? So there was no forgiving for rebellions whatsoever. And the, the, on the other hand, the Vietnamese who were very, very few because they were expelled and everybody was uh, dreaming of being expelled. And some historians use the word deported. You are deported when you don't want to go. Uh, the Jews were deported to the concentration camps, but the Vietnamese were not deported. They were free. And many Khmer uh, went away to Vietnam with them. And if they could speak a little bit of Vietnamese, they were led through the border. And the remaining Vietnamese were uh, attacked. These were usually wives of Cambodians. Uh, only in the last year of the regime. So compared to the, the Vietnamese were spared by the regime. Only two or three percent of the Vietnamese were killed, not 25 percent. And the Cambodians, 25 percent of the population Cambodians were killed, but they did not have the, the label of uh, genocide. No. And, <laughs> and the, Cham, the Cham and the Vietnam and the Chinese, exactly the same, one third. One third of the Chinese community was killed, and one third of the Cham community were killed. Why the Vietnamese? Why the, why the Vietnamese? Because they were the bourgeois. Because they were they were killed because they were bourgeois. Because they were the rich people, not because they were Vietnamese. And I'd like to ask you about your experience um, in, in twenty fifteen, uh, correct? No, twenty sixteen. You were a Gettysburg witness. What was it like to, be, to have that experience? Instead of asking him about important things, they insisted, insisted, because he was in charge of security. So were you the person who sent the people, the returnees, to S21? It was not his job at all. It, he, he, his job was to make sure that no thieves would come at night yeah, and steal right. things, no, <laughs> and steal anything in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. That's what he did. 
And he said the only incident was the death of Malcolm Caldwell because it was under his responsibility. And he explained to me that it was a murder, not an act. Elizabeth Becker says that it was a political murder, but she has no evidence of that. And when I said in, at a meeting in Bopana, I have evidence. How can you say that? I was there, and you were not. But she was under her bed. So she did not see what was happening any more than me. Anyway, uh, I, th I think that's an interesting incident, that it was just a murder, a fight between two uh, guards who were loving the same woman. And I have evidence, and this makes sense, because any other uh, political murder is either killed by Pol Pot, he was the greatest friend of Pol Pot. Pol Pot was crazy, but not to that extent. And two, uh, that a, a commando of Vietnamese would have sneaked into Phnom Penh. It was impossible to sneak into Phnom Penh. So the, the two other possibilities are absolutely impossible. And the, uh, so he was asked about question, not so much question about that, but he was asked question about the security in S21, but it, he was not the one who sent people to S21. And in the meantime, the interesting question he could be asked, uh, they didn't ask. I can leave a little time for questions. It was the same, it's the same for me. I did not choose at all to say what I wanted to say. Uh, you you based your question on my book, so uh, it's a question I can answer, and I have something to say. But most of the questions of the tribunal were quite irrelevant to me. Um, thank you very much, Kenzie. Um, I know we only have 15 minutes left, so I want to... Do you have any questions here? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, conversation. Yeah, and really appreciate how you um, ask question a lot of question that uh, interesting question uh, I, I hear from. My I have two questions. First, um, I also work. Um, actually, I also interview a number of uh, former Khmer Rouge uh, since two thousand ten. Yeah. Um, yeah, myself, yeah, and the common critics is that there's two things, the former Khmer Rouge lied, or uh, first the, uh, the the critics about uh, the, the, the interview with former Khmer Rouge is that whether the former Khmer Rouge lied to you or the former Khmer Rouge tell only part of the truth. And that, uh, Dr. Hongri Lokat, how could you explain or um, evaluate uh, Pipun in your books? How much Pipun tell the truth or, uh, yeah, uh, or respond to the critics? That, that's my first question. This, uh, all right. With your interviews with people and doesn't do anything. Because I was told by this man, Tabwe, that Rochon Tving had been involved in a lot of killing. And when I interviewed him, but that was after his brother's death. So that post, I finished my work with Pepun at that time. Uh, and it's true that he gives quite a rosa picture of himself. And I was told, and probably right, that uh, he was not very honest with me. Uh, as to Sun Si Kuen and Pi Puen, and it's the same with Dutch at the tribunal. They don't say 100% of the truth, but probably 80 to 90%. Vast, vast amount of the things that they say is true, because it makes sense. 
when people are lying, and I learned that from my grandfather, who was a policeman, I always learn, I always say the historians are the policemen of the past, base everything on evidence, find proofs. Uh, when people lie, at some stage, they contradict themselves. They say things which are in complete contradiction to what they say before. And, uh, uh, if you interview them for a few minutes, you can't spot that. But if you view them uh, over months and years, uh, in the case of Pipun and Suung Sikun, uh, I know that basically they do not lie. And it's the same with Dutch. Uh, I think Dutch lied only on one, okay, on one thing. Everything that he said is more or less the truth, except one thing. When you went through the entrance door of Dutch, of, 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 of S21, you were already sentenced to death. So I had no authority over the life of death of my uh, prisoners. I don't think this is true, because in every prison there were liberations. Certainly, as they were chosen by the leadership or the top people, uh, there might be fewer. But I think he could have, uh, it is not 100% true that he had no authority over life and death of the prisoners of S21. So to answer your question, um, Dr. Lokar is saying that um, Pip Kwon did not contradict himself. After several years of interviews, his, his stories and his responses were consistent. So it's, it's evidence for him that his responses were the truth. Yeah, um, thank you. And just a little bit of follow-up question. How much you, uh, in your book, um, present it sometime as a perspective rather than the truth? Um, because we, we know, uh, you said, or already said that not 100% truth, but how much in your books that you present um, what people talk, uh, what people say it, as a perspective of the former Khmer rule, rather than it treat as the truth. The former Khmer rules, I, I mean, whether you treat sometime, it is just a perspective of former Khmer rule, rather than, yeah. Of the events, rather than the true historical facts. Yes, well, this is the uh, in any uh, criminal investigation, it's the same, you know. Oh, the witnesses that are uh, to talking talking about uh, Donald Trump now, this week, and, and next week. Uh, you cannot say that any of the witnesses are saying the 100% of the truth is their truth. Uh, but what I, from the historical point of view, uh, the whole of the testimony makes sense, makes a coherent whole, or, or not. And I had that feeling that with the younger, the older brother, I, I was much less satisfied with what you think. And uh, uh, obviously, this man uh, was not talking this, uh, when, when it was pointed out to me that he was not telling the whole truth, I'm not surprised. Yes, it's quite possible. Um, but uh, you, you remark, uh, any witness, you, you could say that he has his own personality. Even if he's sincere, it's, it's not that correspond to 100% of the truth. And I don't say it is 100%. I say 80 to 90% of the truth anyway. But globally, uh, I think the, the, the testimony is very valid, very valuable. And I'm extremely happy to have met Pipun because he answers all the questions, more or less, that we ask about the contribution of the tribal people to the Khmer Rouge Revolution. The Khmer, the Ankalo thought that they were going to be central to the revolution, 
but they have been completely sidelined and they never were central to the revolution. Um, and none of them had imperial. Uh, yeah, but uh, 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 Bunchan, Bunchan, I think it was called Bunchan, the highest responsibility they had under the Khmer Rouge were being Srok, leader of Srok, of, of district leaders. They could be up to district leaders. And Bunchan was a very interesting witness and been in, uh, I've got his long testimony, and I learned lots of things from him. And I think he was genuine too because it makes sense for the whole edifice of democratic Kampuchea. Um, he, um, uh, he was interviewed by many other people, and I think he said the truth, and he told me that uh, uh, Pot Pot wrote on the blackboard 600,000 uh, victims of American bombing, for instance. So that is a very important picture. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, people told me, if we don't empty the cities, we don't know how long we can stay in power. That tells it all. And he cannot have invented it. He simply cannot in have invented that. So they did not evacuate the cities for uh, uh, grand ideas about the contact with the peasants, the Real life was the farmer's life, and so they rationalize after that. They give excuses. And on top of that, it seems that Noon Chief, when he was interviewed in Enemies of the People, which I saw recently, Noon Chief himself believed that the Americans were going to bomb Phnom Penh. He believed in his own lies, which is the most extraordinary thing. So even from Nunchi, who is lying all the time, we can learn things that he believe in his lies. Yeah, um, I has a, about the uh, question about uh, Sipon. Uh, Sipon is a Jarai minority and also in uh, Rotnakri and Mandogri has many group of uh, uh, minority. And how about another group of minority uh, during the Khmer Rouge, they join also or not? Yeah. Uh, are you talking about the Kapoor? Who? He's, he's talking about the Tampoon? Or brow or to crack and so yeah. Yes, I, I think I answered this uh, question in my book, um, that the ethnic minorities, well, I think the Jarai and the Tampun intermarried together, and Pipun is both Tampun and Jarai, right, one. Uh, there is a, probably in this group a, a slightly higher proportion who joined the Khmer Rouge, willingly. And uh, Krishna Ok, who was the, lady, the director in this institution. She'd made her PhD on, I think, a Tampun or Jarai. I think it was Jarai village. And at the end of her investigation, she asked, um, how many joined the Khmer Rouge? And they answered, oh, the whole village. Right. So there was a, a higher proportion that joined the revolution in this, this group. Um, and they tend to do it together, either the whole village or none of the village. So they tended to follow each other. Uh, but what is most important is the vast, vast, vast majority detested the Khmer Rouge regime and a huge percentage ran away. And those who could not wait just 
obeyed and, and, and diligently, but they did not suffer as much as the rest of the country for the main reason is that they were given enough food. They did not starve to death in Ratanakiri, in Mondolkiri, in Priyavihia. The further you were from Tompen, the more food you had, basically. So that's very important. They, so they died and fewer were arrested. Uh, but 90% uh, to 95% of the regime detested the, detested the Khmer Rouge uh, after initially sympathizing with them. But this honeymoon did not last. It lasted a couple of years at most. How about the, about the ed beginning? They uh, follow the CNO or Pol Pot? That, okay. They have their existence as a separate. They call, CNO call them Khmer Le. Khmer, first Khmer. So they must immediately assimilate. They must put on the uh, trousers, not uh, a loincloth. The women must stop showing their breasts, so like Tartuf, you know, in, <laughs> in uh, Moliere, hide this uh, breast that, I, you know, I, he could not see. Uh, he wanted to get rid of the breast. Oh, yes, so they all thought that men, that they had their shirt to slash and burn. But right, they never tasted it, but they thought that it was completely stupid. Uh, you go rice on water, in water, not on dry soil, and so on. So uh, they deny, com denied completely uh, the specificity, the originality, their language, their uh, habits, their, uh, their feet, the ceremonies. Uh, so it was not, Stenuk was not <laughs> terribly popular. In fact, I think you mentioned in your, in your book that um, Ipuan, was one of the first people to shoot at Siyunuk's forces. Mm -hmm. And they have, in fact, been the first shots of the Khmer Rouge Revolution. Mm -hmm. When Siyunuk's forces came up to Ratanakiri, mm -hmm. uh, presumably in pursuit of the Khmer Rouge uh, rebels and leaders, and Pipun was among the first to shoot at them. Yes. Uh, yes, it's not impossible that it is Pipun who shot the first sh shots of uh, the Civil War, uh, 1968. It's 1968. Everybody says that there's many people say that the Civil War started after the uh, uh, coup d'etat. They always use the word coup d'etat against Yanuk. It was not a coup d'etat. It was completely legal. They followed strictly the constitution. Yanuk had never been uh, appointed head of state for life. You cannot be head of stage for life unless you are a dictator. He was not a dictator. Or you're a king. He was no longer a king. So he was got rid. And I was in Cambodia just before. And the Sianuk had become very unpopular for, for his very bad ma management of the economy, one. And two, crawling at the feet of uh, Mao. All educated Cambodians did not like that at all. So they said, oh, we have enough of him. We don't want him anymore. So the, it intensified, of course. The, it accelerated because Sianuk was preaching, come and join me into the Maquis immediately. On the 20th, he was dismissed on the 18th of March. On the 23rd, so 18 to 23rd is what, so it's five days later, he appealed on the radio. And this appeal was repeated and repeated and repeated again and again. Come and join me into the Maquis. I think that's a, a fitting end here. Um, I want to thank you again, Dr. Henri Lecar, <laughs> for a really fun and interesting discussion tonight about your book, Jungle Heart of the Khmer Rouge. I encourage everyone to read it. I read through it and found a lot. I, I mean, I did, had no idea about this role of the Khmer Le, the Highland Khmer in the, in the revolution. So this was very enlightening for me. Um, so thank you very much for coming and sharing your, your book and your ideas.
I think very well organized. It's not so much by me, it's by Sun Sikwen, you know, I, because all the world, the books I wrote, I wrote with the Khmers. I've always worked with the Khmers uh, because we cannot work alone. Uh, and and, and uh, the Khmers are quite happy to have uh, our contribution too. Uh, it's very, very well organized, very clearly. Uh, we follow the chronology very well, uh, the chapters uh, are well, well organized. And well, there's a little bit of me, but there's a lot of. Uh, in some ways, uh, try to atone, to express their regret. being part of this criminal revolution. It's one of the ways for them to be reintegrated into society and express. Because in it's something in, in this country that in in Europe we are on we used to be no longer today Christians. And Christians say one crime or sin uh, confessed is already half pardoned, and this is what happened in 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 South Africa with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We expect these people at least to tell the truth and confess. And the only Khmer Rouge leader who's done that with power is Dutch. Is there anyone? So personally, and a lot of Europeans would admire him because he confessed. Not 100%, but at least 90%. Uh, while uh, Kisampan and Nunchia are absolute liars. They were at the heart of the definition of the criminal policies of the Khmer Rouge, and they never admitted it. They said, oh, I did not know. I don't know. I do not know. You cannot forgive somebody who refuses responsibility, eludes complete responsibility. Well, thank you very much, Henri. Um, so this concludes our talk for this evening. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. I'd also like to remind everyone again about the CKS third mini book fair that will take place on Saturday and Sunday. Um, please come. Um, there will be many booths, many activities for children, many opportunities to read and buy and look at books. Um, we invite you to come and please stay tuned as CKS will be hosting several many, many uh, special events over the course of the year in celebration of the 25th anniversary of the founding of CKS in 1979. I keep talking about the 70s. 1999. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. Look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you, Henri.